A few weeks ago, we jumped at the opportunity of interviewing Jackie Pullinger when she was visiting the UK to speak at a conference on inspiring the church to help people with addiction. But before we listen to Jackie tell her story, here's somebody who's worked with her in her work in Hong Kong. I had uh, the privilege of meeting her when I was with the British forces in 1967 to 69. I lived in Hong Kong at the time. And uh, I was, what would I be? I'd be 30, 28, 30 years of age. She was the same age as me. And she came to Hong Kong and she was uh, teaching at a little school on the island. And she and two friends would go out in the streets almost every day, giving tracts out to young people. Uh, there were a lot of servicemen there coming from Vietnam, American servicemen. And then there'd be other young people who were into Hong Kong on the drug trail, on the opium trail, going through Nepal and Tibet, etc. And she would give them tracks. Came out to my home many times. And she would talk to me about the Wall City. Now, the Wall City was the former police garrison that was in the middle of Kowloon when the British took over possession of that place for a hundred years lease. And they allowed this police group to stay there, or this military group to stay there, to keep order in Kowloon. Well, over the years, of course, as Kowloon grew into skyscrapers and everything, uh, this place became a place of refuge for the drug addicts and the criminals and the prostitutes who were fleeing from the Hong Kong police. To, to get into the Wall City, there were certain shops you could go into, uh, right by the airport in Hong Kong. Go through these certain shops and nobody knew if they were except the initiated. <laughs> And there was a door at the back, and you go in. And she wanted to go into the wall city to be a witness there. So I asked if I could come in with her. And so she said, yes, yeah. she said, so long as you come with nothing in your pockets, I mean, no bulge, so people think you've got something in there, a gun or even something, or money. And uh, so just shorts, which is what I normally wore, uh, knee length socks and shoes and a thin t-shirt, or thin uh, shirt. And so we went in one of the shops, opened the door at the back, and it's a five foot drop to the streets, because Hong Kong is just built up, and the streets of the original city are five foot below us. There's an oil drum to step on, on a cement block, and we stepped down into the street. And the street we arrived in was narrow, you could touch both sides with your hands. And you could see when the, there were colour televisions and the people had colour TV, but the, but the rest, it was just a terrible, terrible state. And the street that I was on had a bottom of slope like this because sewage ran down the street. And as we got down there, the, there's a prostitute over there who was half naked. There's a man of yours twirling a knife, looking at these two intruders. These are the first two things I saw. And the sewage walk coming down the street. And overhead, you can't see up because just overhead, there are bamboo rods which came from one house to the other where people had formerly hung their washing. <laughs> but over the months, the people above them had thrown their dirty water out of the window. So this had been covered with potato peelings and all that kind of thing. And so it had rotted. And so the people whose clothes had been destroyed or ruined just left them there. So overhead was this network of rotten food. And as we walked, Jackie thumped it and you could hear the rats scurrying around as you walked. Then there'd be a gap and you could see five stories up to the sky. Then there'd be another matted covering from this. And that's what we walked through. I remember walking past an open building where there were maybe half a dozen or more men lying on the ground with their opium pipes, opium drug, opium house. And we walked along and 
Then we found a man lying in the sewage. So my first experience of the place. And so Jackie gets down on the knees and pulls him out of the sewage, props him against the wall, takes a white handkerchief from her pocket and wipes his face down. I'm standing beside her. This is this was a surreal, this was another world then. I didn't know people lived like this. Welcome to the interview where today my guest is a very special guest. I want to say welcome to Jackie Pullinger. Many, many of you will instantly recognize the name of Jackie Pullinger and you begin to think of Hong Kong and you begin to think of of the walled city and, and triads. But maybe there's a whole generation which the name means nothing to. I was speaking to a young member in our office and I said, I'm excited because I'm going to be interviewing Jackie Pullinger. And they looked at me and said, who's Jackie Pullinger? That's a real put down, Jackie, isn't it? Well, why should they know? (laughs) Well, you have a book that um, certainly many people will have read, Chasing the the Dragon. And uh, we're so appreciative of being able to to, to talk with you. Jackie, if I said to you, just sum up for for somebody who is saying to you, what do you do? What is your your work? What would you say? Mm. Sharing Jesus with anyone who'd like to hear. That's it. And particularly, you've, you've been doing that in what we call the Far East, haven't you? Uh, yeah, I've been in Hong Kong since 66. Right. Jackie, I, I want to go back to, to the beginning, if we can, because you, you were brought up here in the UK and, uh, and a nice family reading you, you, your background. You wanted to be a missionary even before you became a Christian. Mm-hmm. Tell us about it. Well, uh, we were in Sunday school, and this um, we were sitting on baby chairs. Um, I'm a twin, and we were sitting on these little chairs, and this real missionary came, um, and uh, you know she had the the bun and the long skirt, the whole bit, and uh, she she pointed her finger at us and said. Um, and could God want you on the mission field? And um, I remember thinking, um, I'm sure God wants everyone on the mission field. Uh, the answer can't be no. Um, the problem was I didn't know what a mission field was. Um, in, in my mind, it was something like a, a rugby pitch. Um, so after that, um, I told everyone, I'm going to be a missionary. Um, now, I didn't like God, um, but I had already worked out that um, he got you in the end. So I was com- completely sure at the end of my life I was going to see him. And so I thought it might be um, helpful if I, if I was on his side, you know, like on the mission field. So. <laughs> but m- m- most people, I, I don't know how old you were when, when that, that happened. Five. But- Right. M- most people, when they're five, they, they want to be a, I don't know, nurse, teacher, model, a- a- anything, but, but not a missionary. Well, no, it, it wasn't I want to be. It was um, surely God wants everybody to be. That's it. Right. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. It wasn't thrilling. You know, I, 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 I also wanted to be an acrobat, you know, or a mountain climber, but... Uh, but I'm sure God wanted everyone to be missionaries. Not that I quite understood what that was. But but church and Sunday school were, were just part of your life as you grew up, weren't they? Um, a serious part of my life. I just didn't like God. Yeah. Yes. So how did you have an encounter with God? Um, well, I was going to say despite the Christians, but that sounds a bit rude. Um I mean, I hadn't met any that looked as if they liked him, you see, growing up. Um, So all the people that talked to me about knowing Jesus looked a bit scary. Um, And uh, the the first time I really remember noticing people um, who looked as if they liked him was um, after I was coming back from a party. Um, a, not a very good party. Um, so, some old school friends of mine noticed me on the on the train, looking pretty bad, I expect. 
And they said to, to, to one another, hey, Jackie really needs God. Um, but thankfully, they didn't say that to me. So they just said, um, well, we have these parties every week where we, we sit around and talk and drink coffee. And there are some really nice men. And uh, we talk about the Bible. So I said, well, yes, I would go. Um, I was quite interested in, in, in meeting some really nice men. Um, and that was, the, that was the first time I actually met people who had talked about Jesus um, and looked normal. You know, they, they talked about racing cars and bikinis as well. So it was probably the first time I actually listened um, and heard, heard some things I didn't like that well. You, you realise people at home are instantly thinking, what do I look like? And do I present myself as, a, as, as Jackie thinks a Christian looks like or not? Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'd seen some real ones and I'd missed them. But, um, you know, the, the, some of the ones that, that used to talk to me said, oh, you'll change when you know Jesus. And I remember thinking, oh, hope not, you know, because they didn't look as if they liked him much. Um, but, but when I saw people who... who who really looked as if they enjoyed him, then I was more interested in hearing about what he said. So you were at the Royal College of Music at that time, were you? Yeah. Right. And uh, so, so you went along to, to, to these events, and, and the Christians were, were, were fairly normal. <laughs> uh, how did you actually come to have an encounter with God? Well, we went to a Bible study. <clears throat> it was a girls' one. Um, the, 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 the nice thing about this bunch of uh, Christians was that we weren't associated with, with something called a church building. Um, we, we just met in apartments. Um, and uh, so I was in a girl's Bible study, and um, it was one of those ones where you fill in the blanks. Um, and, and, you know, I always think you have to be silly not to get 10 out of 10 for those. So we were filling in... Um, uh, God so loved the blank that he gave his blank that if blank believe in him, then blank should, and so on and so on. So I filled in the blanks. And um, then uh, then we got to praying. And they all closed their eyes, um, and I didn't. And I looked at them praying. And um, they, were, they were thanking God um, for, for knowing they had eternal life. And I looked at them and I thought, Oh, good heavens, they believe it. They they really believe they have eternal life. And then I thought, oh, wait a minute, I've just filled in the blanks. Um, I have eternal life too because I've accepted that, that Jesus is the way to God. Not, not very happily, but I had. Um, and so... Then I then I really thank God for having eternal life, and I was really um, happy for about thirty seconds. Um, and then I thought, oh, horrors! Uh, I mean, if I have eternal life, and I believe I do, um, because of Jesus, that means some people don't. And um, I, I'm not sure if I can be um, thrilled at. at being with him forever when there are some people I love who are not. So um, my friends got up to um, cook risotto. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I've just come to know Jesus, so I'm, I was a bit intense. And um, I, I was thinking to myself, risotto, you know, how can you eat risotto? With the, there are people perishing without Jesus. Um, I... I, I, I so I went out to find one um, and found a, a woman sleeping on a bench. Um, and I suppose it's always been like that. So here you were, five-year-old, you'd had a call to be a missionary. Now you've become a believer. Suddenly, the two come together. And if we fast forward your story, you end up in Hong Kong. But Jackie, you were only in your early 20s and you didn't quite follow the route of how to become a missionary. 
In fact, did, did you, didn't you apply to some of the societies, missionary societies, well, and ask them if they would send you? Yeah, I did follow the route, actually, because I've looked at the Bible. I just, um, I, I just didn't follow the, 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 conve- the church convention route of, of uh, 40 years ago. Uh, no, I, I, uh, once, once I knew I had eternal life, I, I thought, well, there's, there's nothing else to do with the rest of your life but, um, but share Jesus. So I, I began to pray about what to do, and he said, go. So um, every time I prayed, he said, go. So I, I looked up missionary societies in, in, in the telephone book. Um, and the first one I came to, I won't tell you which one, mm. <laughs> was a fairly uh, uh, early, early letter in the alphabet. Um, you and... realise everyone's trying to work it out now. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote to them and uh, they said... Uh, well, no, you, you, you can't. You have to be uh, 25 um, and you have to go to missionary college and learn how to be one. So I, I said, well, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Um, I, I, I think um, I can't wait till I'm 25 because um, Jesus might come back. So I, I, I am anxious to be, to be going quick. Um, and they said, sorry, those are our rules. So I couldn't go with them. Um, and I said, well, you know, can I go and teach in one of your schools uh, and not be called a missionary? And they said, no, couldn't do that. Um, interestingly, I actually did end up in one of their schools uh, because the, the, the lovely story, I mean, it was fun. O- over the next few months, I kept praying and God kept saying go one way or another. Through, through dreams, through visions, um, and uh, through a prophecy. And this was in 1966. This was really before people were much talking about these things. Uh, but God said to me, um, go and I will lead you. And it ended up, you went and visited a, a vicar, I think, and talked with him uh, because you, you were just getting confused in the advice. What, what did he say to you? Um, well, I said, um, God's been telling me to go. Um, he's spoken to me through scripture, through prophecy, through a dream, through a vision. Um, but he hasn't been very helpful about where. So I, I think I'll stay here. This was in the East End of London. And I'll help you. And he said, no, um, if God's telling you to go, you should go. Um, and I said, well, I can't go, we, we, you know, because he hasn't told me where. Um, so we've got to stalemate. Um, and he said, well, if God gave you um, a, a, a ticket and, a, and an old age pension and health insurance, uh, you, you wouldn't need to trust him. So why don't you just go, um, get, get on a ship, find the cheapest one you can calling in the most different countries um, and pray to know where to get off. And um, so I thought, oh, that sounds, that sounds such fun. I'd love to do that. Um, but it has to be cheating because I'm sure missionaries have to suffer. So I said, well, um, you know, isn't that cheating? And he said, no, it's biblical. Um, that's what Abraham did. He was told to get on a ship. Uh, sorry, he was told to go to a country um, and he didn't know where he was going and he spent a number of years not getting there. But he went because he believed. So um, it, it, was a, it was a fun thought actually because um, I thought, you know, anything could happen. Um, the, the, the vicar was quite smart um, he didn't give me the idea I had to get off the boat and do anything. Uh, just, it was an adventure. Because he said, maybe you go all the way around the world just to talk to one sailor about Jesus. Or maybe you get off and play the piano for a week of youth meetings in Singapore and come back or something. So it, it, in a sense, I thought, um, I can't lose. Um, and then I thought, maybe we'll get shipwrecked. And, and, and I will 
land up on on an island where where there's just one person waiting to hear about Jesus. So that would be fun. Jackie, I'm eager to, to, to move on to Hong Kong, but if we just pause for a moment, there, there may be some people who, are, well, there are Christians, many Christians who say, I so sense a call of God in my life, but all my circumstances make it impossible for me to, to step out and do that. How, how would you speak to them today and, and help them to, to say, look, overcome the circumstances if God's calling? I, I, no, I don't understand the way you put that at all. God's got a call on every life, so uh, and nobody can, uh, nobody can stop what God's called you to. So it's you know we don't have to overcome that much. We just have to uh, believe it and say, um, you know, I'm willing. Uh, he 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 does the overcoming. So or he did the overcoming. So it, it's it's actually simpler, you know. To, to do what God says, they're not. We it, allow so much baggage to get in the way at times. Well, no, if you don't do what God says, you get sicked up by a whale. So, you know, it's smarter. to, to It's actually easier to do what God says than not. Um, yes. But back in the 60s, Jackie, p- people didn't just go off on the mission field on their own. You had to, as you said, apply to a society. You had to be trained properly. You, you had to be approved by a committee. But, but you said, no, God's called me. I'm going. And you got on that boat and ended up in Hong Kong. Well, no, it was, it was very easy. I mean, actually, anyone can, can do something like this because I, I didn't think I'm a missionary. I've got to go somewhere and do anything. You haven't. All you, all you have to do is follow where God says, share Jesus with whoever you can. That's it. Um, so anyone can do that. I mean, you can, you can go to the supermarket this morning and say, all right, Lord, lead me. And maybe you pray for a sick man or, 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 or you pick up a child who's crying. That's it. It's not much more complicated. You, you haven't got to go off and do anything big. Um, and, 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 and write big letters about it. Or, so I was quite free um, just to obey what he said. That's all Abraham did. He obeyed and went. So you obey and go. You don't... Uh, I, I, I wasn't making out that I was going to do anything much. Um, Jackie, you ended up in Hong Kong. And, and just looking at the back cover of your book... It talks about the walled city in Hong Kong. It says it was a notorious, sprawling warren of slums, rats, gangsters and drug addicts in the Kowloon district of Hong Kong. Drug smuggling and heroin addiction flourished, as did prostitution and pornography, extortion and fear. Strangers were unwelcome. It was truly one of the most dangerous places on earth. And yet that's where you ended up. Well, that was God's choice, really. <laughs> I can imagine, Mudge, just even reading those words. So many people would say, but weren't you frightened? Didn't you have fear? You know, didn't you take advice before you went in and went in with... You know, well, I went in with a missionary. And... No, that was... That was she, 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 I, I visited all the, all the missionaries I could find when I got there, and she asked me to go in. I didn't know what it was. I just thought I was going to a poor place. Um, so I, I didn't know that it was an illegal city. It was actually left out of the um, the treaty between Britain and China. That's why it was illegal and that's why all these um, drug smuggling and, and selling women and, and, and gold and drugs and things could, could flourish in there because it was outside the law. Um, but I didn't know that. And uh, after this missionary took me in, she had a little school in there. Um, she asked me if I would teach there. And uh, I already had another job. So I, I went and taught there for her several times a week. And I just found every time I went, um, it, was, it was just like there was singing in my heart. Um, you know, I just, I liked being there. So it it wasn't hard. Um, 
I suppose uh, sometimes I got frightened, but normally um, only frightened backwards. You know, like if you're in danger, you, you, you might act immediately. And then afterwards they think, oh, dear, that was terrible. <laughs> but at the time, you know, it, it was not so frightening because I, I like the place and I like the people. Hmm. And, and the culture, I mean, everything was so different. The, the language was different. Uh, I mean, you talk about, you know, keeping your head down because somebody might be emptying the toilet bucket and it might fall on you and all of the, the, the crime and the, the, the drugs that were there. Um, how did you begin as, as, a, as a good Westerner from a, a, a nice home back in England? How did you adjust? Well, you know, one in four of the world look, lives like that now anyway. So uh, I, I, I know that now that what I was seeing was something extreme, but uh, I suppose uh, I was thinking more like um, I could have been born here and... If if I were born here, maybe maybe I would have been sold to a brothel, or maybe I would have got needle marks in my arms. So it it you know you it you're not so much thinking about poor me as uh, why wasn't it me? Um, and 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 then. It was, well, I was born in a place where I could choose. And, and at some point, I heard about Jesus and I could choose. Uh, I, I would like them to be able to choose. Uh, so I never felt I'd got to sock Jesus to people who didn't want to hear, but that they should have a choice uh, of, of, of hearing that they're, they're is a God who loves us enough to send his son to die and and that there is hope um, because most of the people or especially the young ones that I saw there wasn't a choice they were going to um, join a gang and sell drugs or um, live off women just as a, a normal a normal thing and I didn't think it right they they didn't have a choice. And so in time, you began a youth club and, and began to befriend. Um, and, and at the end of the day, Jackie, it's all about individuals and lives who've been changed. And uh, towards the end of your book, you talk about a, a lady called Elfrida. And you, you say of her sexually confused, not knowing whether she loved or hated men, Elfrida became a prostitute and dulled her senses with heroin but Jesus. Could you tell us her story? Well, my, my home was filling up um, with men uh, because the Holy Spirit had come on one man um, and when the, in, in, the, in the walled city, he, he was a, um, one of the gang leaders. And um, when the Holy Spirit came on him, he spoke in tongues and actually got off drugs without pain um, through speaking in tongues. And then all his friends knocked at my door. This is the short version and said, uh, oh, well, if Jesus can change him, then I'll have Jesus and I'll live in your house. So um, with, with some friends, um, we just kept renting more apartments. Um, well, later on, those friends had uh, left Hong Kong and there was I was, um, my place was full and uh, I used to pass this little lady um, in the street and she she would pull my sleeve. Um, the street is very narrow. Where she sat was just uh, two, three feet wide and she sat on a step because the, the walled city was um, on a slope. <clears throat> and uh, she used to, to poke the sewer she was sitting over the sewer she, um, to to make the sewage move 
Um, otherwise, the rats uh, would would come and bite her feet. So she used to pull my sleeve and say, um, "Please let me live in your house. Please let me live in your house. I'll do anything. I'll iron for you." Um, because she heard that um, the 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 men that had come to to stay with me um, and stay with my friends. Um, that Jesus had changed them, so she thought um, she would come. Well, she's 60, This is and still working. Um, and if she wasn't working, she was guarding the young girls, because that's what you do when you get old. You, There's nothing else to do. You guard the young ones. And uh, so I thought, well, I don't think it's very suitable to take a... a, a, a a prostitute into my home. Um, so I tried to avoid walking past her um, in case she believed in Jesus, really, because uh, I don't think you can tell someone Jesus loves you and and not help them. And I don't think that somebody can believe in Jesus and you leave them there. So I avoided the street um, until one day... Um, I couldn't resist it. So she came to stay with us. We found a little cupboard. So she's very small. Um, she's not five feet, and it was a very small cupboard. And I found some, found some friends. And we did what we did when we prayed for um, the men. Um, we, we did four-hour duties on her. We prayed in tongues. Now, when we undressed her, uh, to, to put her in pajamas. We found um, bruises on her back. Uh, that was um, where she'd been injected. That was her payment for, for prostitution. And she belonged to this brothel where um, two uh, other women had been murdered and uh, she'd had to take one to the hospital um, because this young woman had refused to sell herself and they'd put a pipe down her throat and pumped her full of water. She was pregnant. And uh, so these awful stories came out, but at the same time uh, out came the, 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 the heroine, because as she prayed in tongues and we prayed in tongues, she came off drugs without physical pain. But of course this is the beginning of her life only. She's got years of horror because uh, her mother hung herself. She watched her father have affairs with people of both sexes and relations through a keyhole. She'd been uh, cast off by her father, uh, and uh, she'd lost her identity card. She ca actually came from Macau, so she wasn't someone who existed. And the reason that she pulled my sleeve was she was afraid she would die, and nobody would know she'd lived. She would, she didn't exist. Anyway, uh, she she used to cry every time we worshipped and we prayed for her. And after a bit, I thought, oh, this is terrible. I mean, she has a new life, but she's got so much pain. However long are we going to have to pray for her? Um, and then we started to take her to an old people's home, and she came back very cross one day and said, "It's not like our place." In our place, we have worship, and we sing, and we pray for people, and in there, they just feed them. So she started to go to this old people's home and to um, to pray for them and to sing to them. She went back to Old City, found another old lady, it, it's still working, who'd been cast off by the brothel because she'd gone mental, and uh, she was sticking to the bed because she urinated in the bed and there were bed bugs and everything. And she used to wash her hair and pray for her and tell her about Jesus. And once she began to look after other people, her pity for her awful life went. Um, and she really changed. Later on, she got married. And she got married in, uh, in white, which was a great sight waiting for all her life. And, and a few weeks later, another 
similarly aged lady uh, came to her and said um, she was getting married and could she please borrow her wedding dress? And she and Elfrida said to her, yes. And then she came to me and she said, I said yes, but no, of course she can't. She can't wear white. She's been married before. <laughs> and and, and she, she has just continued to, to serve the Lord, has she? And, uh, well, she's, she's gone to heaven now. Right. Yes, she's gone to heaven. A lot of, the, of that generation have. I mean, she was pretty old when she came to live with us. Yeah. But, but Jackie, I mean, just listening to that story of Elfrida, and, and, and I sense you, you took on their pain, you took on their hurt, uh, and that's just one of what must be countless stories that you can tell. H- how have you coped emotionally with the, 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 the whole uh, pressure of it? Um, well, m- m- I don't think my heart's that big, really. Um, I, I, I could... I could mostly manage one at a time. That's it. Um, but that seems to be all right because um, when Jesus died for us, I think he died for us as if we were the only one. So uh, you 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 do share the pain. I mean, you know, if there's people like her and I still, uh, after all these years, get, called in the, at the in the night three o'clock four o'clock uh, I mean sleepless nights is 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 it um, but after each one you can offload you 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 don't have to you walk with them and you and you share their pain but you, you don't if you carried it you would die so I bet you can offload and 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 uh, and, and, and give it back to Jesus because he 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 said um, that it's it the burden's light. Hmm. But you're sitting there, if I, if I may say, looking remarkably calm and and sharing these stories. There must have been times when you were screaming at God, where you were in despair at situations that were happening. What scream at God? What, what, what? Were there not times when you where you were saying, "Lord, whatever situation have you brought me into?" Oh no, no, what? no, 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 no. That's about me. Okay, my the, my life really isn't about me. Uh, my, I mean, if I'm still here, my life is about them. Okay, so if, if there's a the if there's a difficult situation, um, I'm not screaming at God about what I'm going through. I mean. I haven't been raped. One in five women in the whole world has been, you know. So I've had it easy. Um, I wouldn't scream at God, God. I'm much more likely to say, God, you promised this and you promised that and you promised this and you promised that. I haven't seen it. Now I'm going to work this through with you until I see you do what you said you'd promise because I believe you promise. You're not holding out on me. It's just that I haven't grasped how this works yet. So that's what I'm interested in. Not, you know, what a terrible time I'm having. But if you promise this, God, why are we not seeing it? And this is what I want to learn. So many people in in, in the West are, are longing to see the reality of God in an even greater way than they are in their lives already. How would you encourage them to take this step of faith that you did and and to begin to move out? Well, uh, I think you only... You get more faith when you get more desperate. Uh, There are enough desperate people in the world, so... Um, for instance, if, if you're, if you're in a place where a lot of people are hungry, then you'll need to pray that food is multiplied. Um, if, if you've got lots in the bank and you've got lots of food, you're not likely to learn that lesson that quick. Uh, if you're amongst sick people and there's no doctor, uh, and you, you learn to pray for the sick. Um, so I, I, I think we're supposed to be in more uncomfortable places 
um, so it's that we will call upon the Lord. And I think that's one of the reasons he said, um, go to the poor. Because when we go to the poor, we realize we're poor. When we go to the poor, we realize we haven't got enough to give them. Our own resources of heart or stamina or money or generosity or anything else are gone so quick. So I think we're supposed to go to where we run out. And when we run out, we get him. Um, but 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 many people think it's the opposite way. It's nothing to do with the, the West. Many people think it's the opposite way around. They stay in church and say, dear Lord, please give me more. Mm. Like more faith or more Holy Spirit or... Whereas I think you're supposed to go to where you will run out and then you get more. Well, you certainly were in a situation in Hong Kong where you were run out and, and in an uncomfortable situation. But gradually you began to, to build friends with the gangs and the gang leaders. Um, you, you began to talk to them about the Lord Jesus and lives began to be changed. Mm. Do you, can you share someone else's story with us? Well... Uh... I shared a little earlier about the Holy Spirit coming on on, on one guy um, and he spoke in tongues um, and was through withdrawal. So uh, I, I thought, I, I mean, I wasn't surprised. I thought, you know, if you believe in God, he'll do that. Um, but I wasn't expecting to have to um, help him grow up. I thought he was a, a new man in Christ. He could go out to work the next day. Um, so it was a surprise, and I learned something about helping drug addicts, which is actually why, why I'm in the UK this week. Um, but when many of the gang members uh, began to pour in, um, then I got a, a word from the gang leader, um, he was quite a famous guy and uh, I hadn't met him um, I used to send him messages um, and he had originally sent this uh, the first one on whom came the Holy Spirit he'd sent him to guard me um, because my place had got uh, knocked up um, they painted sewage on the walls and I'd broken the windows and, and the chairs and things. And uh, when he heard about it, he said to them, you have to go back and you have to t put back the things you've taken. And they said, we can't um, because we, we, we roughed it up and she won't forgive us. And he said, you have to. Uh, she will forgive you. She has to because she's a Christian. So... Uh, I heard about this story later and realized that he was uh, watching. And uh, I, one day, um, my typewriter got taken from my place. And, uh, and it appeared a few weeks later in my bookcase. And I said to the, the guys who were living there, who were, you know, they'd come to Jesus, but they weren't very changed. And I said, uh, how did it get back here? And they said, uh, <coughs> we do, well, we don't want to tell you. And uh, when I pushed them, they said, well, this came through um, Gogo, which was the name of the gang leader. And I learned that he had found out who took my typewriter. He'd um, paid for the pawn ticket himself and told them, put it back and don't tell her it was me. So I decided to, to, to meet him and I had to wait for several hours outside an opium den because he was an opium addict and I trapped him at the bottom and I said now we're going to tea so we went off to tea um, and he drank Horlicks and <laughs> we sat there and um, and I God gave me uh, words of knowledge I knew he was afraid at night um, I knew that and I spoke to him as if I knew and then I said to him, uh, actually, I really want to thank you. You're just like Jesus. Um, because I was your enemy and I've come to take your brothers away from you. Because he, 
he controlled about 120,000. Um, they ran the the girls and the and the gambling dens and the opium And dens. he was the leader. He was of the leader. The gang. Yeah. Yes. And uh, and I said I was your enemy, but um, that's what Jesus did for me when I was his enemy. He uh, he paid for my life um, with his own. And I was your enemy, and you paid for my typewriter with yours. You, you're just like Jesus. And he was so embarrassed. He he fled, you know, paying for the for the drinks with a with a thousand dollar note. Um, and years later, uh, it it was a it was a great story. He 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 got arrested and convicted when I was not in Hong Kong for having a large amount of um, opium, cooking it. It was about three and a half kilos, which is a lot. And um, he'd been found guilty. And I went to visit him in the court after the sentence. And he said, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. And I said, oh, come on, you've been found guilty. Just accept your sentence and I'll pray for you. And um, I gave him a, a Bible and he said, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. Um, he said uh, it was somebody else was cooking it in my walk. And uh, so it's a very long story. Mm. But um, I found the person whose opium it, it was. It wasn't him. Yeah. But now he's been found guilty. So um, this person hadn't been at the trial. So I told this person about Jesus, very small little guy, uh, whom I had to wait for several hours outside an opium den and he came to Jesus and uh, the the next two weeks later he came back to the court uh, for sentence and uh, he was quite changed and I said to him what's happened and he said you told me to call on the name of Jesus and when I was in the prison I was going through drug withdrawal and I called on the name of Jesus and I just had no pain. He came off drugs. And uh, the the guard let me in and said I could just have five minutes in the cells with him. But uh, in fact, it was half an hour. He began to prophesy. He began to speak in tongues. Wow. He wept his way through a whole bo box of tissues. And then, now he's a Christian and he's prophesying. <laughs> We've got to undo this trial. I mean, it's a very big one. Yes. Uh, and that's another story. But uh, we did, uh, and uh, he, he was let out on appeal. And uh, the other other guy, it, it was a long story, yeah. but he hired a double-decker bus and uh, took all his friends down to the beach where he was baptized. Wow. Well, if you'd like to know more of the stories that Jackie's telling us, I'd encourage you to read her book, uh, Chasing the Dragon. It's certainly one that is going to challenge you in terms of your faith. Jackie, you're here in the UK because you're part of a Isaac conference that is going on at the moment. <laughs> I have to confess, I'd not heard of Isaac until I had this opportunity of coming and talking to you. Can you just tell us briefly what Isaac is? Um, let me just... Let me just read. It's, um, oh, where's the Isaac? It, it, briefly, I, Isaac is an international coalition um, of uh, people who are interested in helping um, drug addicts um, of any kind throughout the world. Um, and I've been associated with them for a number of years. They, they encourage one another. They have equipping sessions and information also for, for um, the public at large to understand the problems of addiction. Mm. Uh, Clearly addiction in, in Hong Kong is, is something that you faced and you've seen the Lord at work. There was a very interesting quote on this Isaac news sheet here where David Partington, the General Secretary of the Isaac International, says, if the slow but sure drift of young people into the slavery of life-controlling substances and behavior is to be arrested, then the church in the UK has got to face up to its God-given call to be involved in helping to transform the lives of those who've been trapped by them. What, as a church here in the UK, 
can we do in, in order to wake up to our call to help those? I think to wake up to the plight of others, we might acknowledge our own plight. Um, we used to wonder in, in Hong Kong why the people who came to, or why many of the people who came to help us, were people who'd had their own problems. Uh, you know, um, difficult homes, difficult backgrounds, um, people who needed healing themselves. I now understand uh, that amongst addicts and the broken, uh, we understand our poverty and therefore we let Jesus into bits of our life um, to heal us and to hold us and to lead us um, and to free us. And a, a, a lot of people who believe in Jesus haven't done that because it looks as if they can function. Uh, and many people who come to help us say, I thought I came to help them, and now I realize it's me that needs the help. So I, I think strangely, um, when Jesus said, worship me in spirit and in truth, one of the first steps in helping the lost is the spirit of truth. And that is actually, although I believe in Jesus, and I know that, and I know the Bible, and I know the what it says, um, there are areas of my life um, where where I feel fearful, or I cover up, or I escape, um, and I'm willing to let God into those parts because the mystery is that the the more poor we feel, the more rich we get. That's why he said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. And as we realize our own poverty, then we partner with those who are poor. Um, and I'm, I'm longing to see that happen because the, there cannot be any church in Britain these days where there isn't somebody who's got a sister or a brother or a father, or a mother who's uh, not addicted to gambling, drink, trying to cut their arms, uh, computers, videos, or, or some secret. Um, and there are so many people that are broken um, that this is rather more normal. I mean, there's hardly a family that these days doesn't have um, a... a some divorce um, or, or, or breakdown in relationships. And I think um, for, for people in the so-called church to start getting real about this is, this is happening everywhere and it's in our midst, um, I'm going to be real about me. Um, and then I want to partner with those who are courageous enough to work through their problems because um, it's, it's rampant throughout the world today. Right. Jackie, many years ago, I can remember being in a church situation and, and struggling to make some breakthroughs. Um, and I read somewhere that you had decided for your breakthroughs, you were going to pray in tongues 15 minutes every day. And, and when you did that over a period of time, you began in Hong Kong to see things happen. How do you keep your faith fresh? so that you're real with God today as you were 30, 40 years ago? Well, if you're not real, um, what you say to other people doesn't work. Uh, you know, it says they, they overcame the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And the word of your testimony is sharing what's real now, not was, you know, not, we've spent line, a lot of time talking about my old story, but it, it if I haven't got a, a real story now, um, then when I tell people about Jesus, it just doesn't quite work. 
so uh, I, I, for me, um, I, I need to keep saying, dear Lord, what is it in me? Or will you show me what in me still needs dealing with? Which he's quite kind to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, not all at once. Mm. But, 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 and you know, the fun thing is the more, the more uh, that he shows me that needs dealing with, then the more of him I've got to share with other people. So actually, uh, instead of getting ashamed that you've still got bits that need dealing with, you think, oh, good, now I've got some more healing. I've, I've got more of Jesus to share with other people. That's, that how, that's how it goes, really. And as you travel from Hong Kong to England and to many other different parts of the world, what are you sensing that God is saying at this moment of time? Find the lost um, and, and, and be kind to people um, because that's how we're salt and light. Short and sweet. Finally, who who would you say are your heroes apart from the Lord Jesus Himself? David, Abraham. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jackie, it's it's been lovely to talk to you. If I said to you, how can we pray for you? What are the uh, the things that are happening in your life now that you'd like the Church in the UK to be praying for? What would you say? Well, I'd, to, I, I'm, I'm here, hopefully, to get people involved with the lost. And, and if they would just pray that the Spirit would, would in, enable that to happen, because there's, you know, one in four of the world is, is, is dying almost to physical hunger these days, let alone uh, dying for lack of Jesus. And that there is so many people to be reached before Jesus comes back. And I think there's not much time. Jackie, it's been lovely to talk to you today. Thank you so much for taking busy, your busy schedule, taking time out to, to come and uh, spend with us. I pray that the Lord will continue to use you and to bless you in all that you do for him. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Thank you for being with us today. My guest has been Jackie Pullinger. It's been a pleasure to have your company. God bless. Bye-bye.